Today we are talking about political parties in the United States, both as they exist in the present and how they developed over time. Professor Graves, could you briefly describe the development of the Republican and then the Democratic Party to give everybody sort of an introduction before we get started? The Republican Party went from, you know, the, the party that ended slavery to the party that now talks about we don't want immigrants. And the Democrats? The pro-slavery party that is now seemingly uh, and the all-inclusive party. And some of you may be asking, hey, how come he's talking about the Democratic Party first? Democratic Party is the oldest political party in the United States. It's also the oldest political party in the world. It was essentially founded in the 1820s. It evolved out of what was called the Democratic Republican Party, which was a party that was founded by the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. Um, Andrew Jackson, first president elected under the Demo uh, Democratic Party. Now, Andrew Jackson is an interesting character. He's an avowed racist. He hated Indians. And that is why his government um, implemented policies that would marginalize various Native American groups. You also have the um, Indian Removal Act, where the federal government moved indigenous people, native people, Indians from their land and put them on the worst possible land uh, in the United States. This policy actually defied the Supreme Court, which ruled that the Cherokee were a dependent nation of the United States and could not be kicked off their land. Uh, however, with the Cherokee Territory occupying large parts of Georgia and Tennessee and North Carolina, President Jackson ignored the Supreme Court and removed these natives by gunpoint. Okay, so Andrew Jackson did not like um, Native people um, very much and like Black people very much. His major incentive was to um, get equality among uh, all white men. Does that include immigrants? Back in the 19th century, when the Democratic Party refers to itself as the Immigrant Party, they are talking about um, immigrant groups from Northern Europe, Northern European countries. Scandinavia, come on in. Uh, Northern France, come on in. Uh, England, definitely come in. Okay. Uh, Greece, uh, we don't really want you Greeks here. Uh, uh. Um, uh, Italians, <laughs> oh God, not really, no, we don't want you here either. Irish, <laughs> no, we don't like you very much. Okay, so even among immigrant groups, there was discrimination in regards to uh, Northern Europeans, Southern Europeans, uh, uh, and, and such. And so the, the immigration that we're talking about in the early part of the 19th century um, are not uh, about people from South America, not, not from Africa, not from China, but the right kind of Europeans. If you are Catholic, <laughs> we don't want you, okay? You're the wrong kind of Europeans. If you're Protestant, we, we want you. You're the right kind of Europeans. If you are interested in this, on the same channel that this is on, on a different playlist, you will find an entire series documenting the history of immigrants to New York City. When these immigrants come to America, the Democratic Party wants to make these white male immigrants part of the voting process. So when you own land as a white male or didn't own land as a white male, whether you're a wealthy white male or a poor white male, um, the Democratic Party in the 19th century trying to ability to vote uh, for all white males. The Democratic Party once called itself the white man's party. Uh, at this point in time, only men can vote. Uh, black individuals are still enslaved, many of them in the United States, and black males don't uh, become able to vote until the 15th Amendment. You can learn more about that if you go check out our video on the Reconstruction Amendment. The Democratic Party is the pro-slavery party. The Democratic Party is the party that wants slavery to exist in the United States. After the Civil War, when the South loses and slavery becomes illegal, the Democratic Party sort of shifts and 
becomes the party of Jim Crow. Not that, you know, the Northern Republicans weren't racist, um, but the Democrats were very insistent on establishing white supremacy. And into the 20th century, they did this through segregationist programs and advocated for states' rights so that uh, states could independently in the South deny black people opportunities like the right to vote, the right to an equal education, the right to serve on juries. And Southern Democrats fought tooth and nail to prevent the passage of civil rights legislation and the Voting Rights Act in 1965. So Andrew Jackson, he he expanded the franchise uh, to all white males in the first half of the 1800s. Republicans under uh, the radical Republicans when uh, Democrats, Southern Democrats, weren't allowed in Congress after the Civil War, expanded the franchise to African-American males. Uh, The next major expansion of the franchise on a federal level uh, happens under Democratic President Woodrow Wilson, who campaigned in 1916 to keep the United States out of World War I. Um, The United States entered World War I, but he won in 1916 on that promise. And a large reason he won is a lot of women pushed their men in their lives to vote for him because they didn't want to send their sons and husbands to war. Um, In some ways, as a reward for that uh, political favor, and in some ways because of a movement that had been going back since the middle of the 1800s, he expanded the franchise, the right to vote, uh, to women in 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment. Now, when we say women, uh, we mean white women, because in the U.S. South, after Reconstruction, we know that African Americans were still largely denied the right to vote. Okay, so another thing about the Democratic Party is that the Democratic Party is the party of the New Deal. And just real quick, the New Deal, uh, again, comes about during the Great Depression, um, and it was focused on intervening by the government on behalf of working-class Americans, many of whom were suffering because of the economic downturn that began in 1929. And it was based on three principles, uh, relief, recovery and reform. It is a massive infusion of money uh, by the federal government for the first time ever, really, uh, into the lives of ordinary Americans and sets up the beginning of what will become the welfare state, uh, where people have something to lean on if they fall on hard times. Before this time, that did not exist as a principle. But to get a pass, uh, Roosevelt had to make some compromises with Southern Democrats um, who didn't want to give the same access of resources to non-white communities. And so certain groups were excluded from the New Deal, uh, including sharecroppers who um, were often impoverished African American. Still, African Americans, along with many poor whites, uh, were drawn to the economic policies of the Roosevelt government, which was offering many of them a helping hand in a way that no party had previously. What you start to see here is a transition for many black Americans going from the Republican Party, the party that was founded on uh, the promise of freeing the slaves, to the Democratic Party, which is more and more actively involving the U.S. government in aiding impoverished Americans. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a Democrat, president from uh, 1933, until 1945, remember he would die, at which point his vice president, Harry Truman, becomes president. But during the Roosevelt presidency, we have the New Deal. And I remember showing you the electoral map in '36, where Roosevelt wins the election by a whole lot of electoral votes. Okay, And that's one of the reasons why Democrats, even to this day, invoke the name of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Another reason that Democrats today still refer to President Roosevelt is uh, he was the president who led us through World War II. Uh, Gary, do you want to talk a little bit about that? America does not get involved in the Second World War until 1941, when the Japanese Navy attacked the American installation in Hawaii. That prompts the American president, FDR, to go and ask Congress for a declaration of war. You're paying attention, only Congress can declare war. This is actually the last time that the United States formally declares war. Now, this obviously doesn't mean uh, that the United States stopped participating in international foreign affairs with its military. It's just the last time that Congress officially declared war. 
you want to hear all the ways that the United States has been involved militarily throughout the globe since World War II and previous to World War II, please check out our U.S. foreign policy video. Uh, the Democratic Party is the party that implemented the Voting Rights Act and the uh, Civil Rights Act. 1964 and 1965, so that was in the 20th century. So because the Democratic Party implemented the, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act that was supposed to benefit black Americans, many whites who were in the Democratic Party who were so opposed to integration, what they did was they left the Democratic Party and they jumped into the Republican Party especially a lot of Southern Dixiecrats, a lot of Southern whites who were against immigration. They left the Democratic Party and went into the Republican Party. And this switch, this evolution of uh, white Southerners um, from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party, this, this didn't just happen. This was an active strategy of Republicans in the 1960s and 1970s who saw an opportunity to gain political power by playing on the racial fears of white Southerners who were really anxious about segregation ending and wanted to protect the structures of white supremacy. Because of this initiative by Republicans, many African Americans who formerly identified as Republicans because this had been the party of Lincoln, the party of abolition, they shifted into the Democratic Party as Republicans refused to back initiatives that would give political and economic power to African Americans. The Republican Party is also known as the GOP. GOP stands for Grand Old Party. It's also known as the Party of Lincoln. The uh, Republican Party was founded in 1854. So the abolitionists in the 1850s were like, were like the people today who were saying that Black Lives Matter. And the abolitionists in the 1850s were the fringe group. Just like in, in 2016, the people who were advocating for the abolition of enslavement of people were looked upon by many Americans, by the majority of Americans in the 1850s as, oh my God, they're those kooks. If we end slavery in America, it's going to be the destruction of America. Abraham Lincoln okay, was the first president elected out of the Republican Party. Okay? And that was in the election of 1860. Abraham Lincoln wins the presidency. And so Abraham Lincoln is president literally through the entire Civil War. The Civil War is the northern states versus the southern states. The Confederate States of America that wanted to secede, those 11 states that wanted to secede, secede, secede means to leave, to leave the Union, to leave the United States, to form their own country based upon slavery. We have to remember that at this time, the South is overwhelmingly Democrat, and the only people who can vote in the South are white males. Uh, they are overwhelmingly voting for Democrats against the new emerging Republican Party. Historically, the Republican Party, when it comes to elections, have been incredibly successful. For the remainder of the 19th century, it's Republican city. The Reconstruction Amendments get added to the federal constitution by the Republicans. Okay, uh, it's the Republican Party that ended slavery. It's the Republican Party that made all those former enslaved people citizens of the United States. It's the Republican Party that gave uh, black males the right to vote. In 1870, in, by after 1870, during the Reconstruction period, you have black senators in Congress, black mayors, black governors, you know, and that won't happen when Reconstruction ends. And all of these black politicians that make a name for themselves, they're getting power because Southern whites aren't allowed to vote because they have you know, been traitorous to the nation as part of the Confederate States of America. And so they're winning political power as Republicans in the U.S. South. With the end of Reconstruction, we have the emergence of Jim Crow and denial of opportunities for black Americans uh, all over the country, but particularly in the U.S. South. It's at this moment that you see a decline in black political representation. So the Republican Party, um, by the turn of the 20th century, was considered the more progressive party. Uh, it was most of the presidents in the progressive era were 
Republican and they were pushing for reforms that helped working class individuals. Um, but this continued to shift, especially with the long, long presidency of FDR, who was very much in support of workers' rights opposed to corporations' rights. And, and so before World War II, Republicans defined themselves in opposition to FDR, the Democrat, right? And after World War II, the Republican Party sort of emerges as, well, both parties were tough on communism, as you can learn more about um, in the foreign policy lecture. Um, the Republican Party uh, is particularly pro-capitalism, particularly um, pro-capital, and, and less inclined to support labor or workers. Senator Joe McCarthy was a Republican, and he was super hard on communism, so much so that the era of McCarthyism gets its name from this senator. This was an era of real fear where McCarthy and others accused a ton of different Americans the, of being communists, having them blacklisted, getting them fired from their jobs. Um, again, both parties declared anti-communist stances, but Republicans tried to show how macho they were and how tough they were on communism over and over again. Uh, this continued into the 1980s as, again, uh, I point you to our foreign policy lecture, when uh, Ronald Reagan declared war on communism in Central America, supporting right-wing dictatorships in, in ways that have lasting impact for the people of Central America and throughout the globe today. With African Americans uh, and those that were involved in electoral politics, leftist organizations uh, increasingly supporting the Democratic Party. Republican President Richard Nixon, who took power in 1969, declared a war on drugs. The uh, drug laws that get ratcheted up in the late 60s and early 70s, okay, uh, they come into effect, you know, and they are meant to go after black communities. Okay, we know that black people and white people use marijuana and use drugs at equal rates. Okay, uh, but you know, uh, th there was a there was uh, black individuals, black communities were specifically targeted. Okay, and again, it's a way to disenfranchise you. If you get arrested, get convicted of the felony, what happens? You lose your right to vote. Guess what that means? You no longer can vote, so I no longer need to worry about you. I don't have to deal with you. Uh, but, you know, Democrats eventually realize also that, you know, tough on crime, uh, this whole mentality, uh, uh, that could be beneficial in terms of winning over white support um, as well. Uh, and in the 90s under President uh, Clinton, uh, as we'll talk about in our civil rights episode as well, there was a tough on crime Democratic government that massively expanded the prison industrial complex. The fact that the United States has 25 percent of the world's prisoners and only 5 percent of the world's population. Uh, that was expanded by both Democrats and Republicans. So that's our short introduction of sort of the two-party system in the United States and how it developed over time. Again, the Democratic Party uh, began as sort of a pro-slavery, anti-native party that wanted to expand the franchise for white males. Um, this was true through the 1960s. Uh, and then with the Southern strategy employed by Republicans, Southern whites um, became more inclined to support Republicans because they were supporting segregation and uh, allowing states to continue structures of white supremacy. Um, and you see a kind of a, a shift in black support from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. And that leaves us where we are today, where uh, the nation is extraordinarily divided between the two parties. Um, Non-white groups overwhelmingly support the Democratic Party, uh, and it's seen as the more progressive party, although leftists and progressives challenge that progressive title for many of the Democratic leaders. Uh, Republicans are seen as the more conservative party, although the presidency of Donald Trump has turned a lot of things on its head, and a lot of people who consider themselves very conservative um, feel that they have trouble supporting this president. And so we are about to enter an election season in 2020 that uh, maybe is the most significant election in terms of how far apart the two parties are right now uh, of my lifetime. And uh, I'm assuming Professor Graves' lifetime as well. Um, but I hope this gives you a little bit of an introduction into this and you will find strands about the political parties throughout the other videos in this course.